Good. Awesome. So I'm just going to do a quick introduction to everyone about you, and then I will begin asking questions. And those of you in the chat, I invite you to please um, ask your questions, put them in the chat, because we'll get to them. Um, so Susan, as I was putting this together, I was thinking, who are the people I want to talk with? And people that I think their work is super important. And we've had some amazing people, including the Napoleon Hill Foundation, Dennis Waitley, um, the author of Becoming Cliterate, who is a professor and teaches women the importance of orgasm, Rabbi Shapiro, Rami Shapiro this morning, which is amazing about divine feminine and biblical texts. And your book, and I know you have several, but The Journey from abandonment to healing, and there are more, I'm gonna hold it up better, I can't see, there we go. There are more books um, that you have out there, but uh, I find it deeply, deeply, deeply important. And, you know, personally, um, everyone has their own story, but m my mother left at a very early age and I didn't see her for eight years. My father emotionally left at one point. I lived on my own from the age of 15 and um, have been married and divorced three times. So I've been running some abandonment things in the background. And while I am 100% fully a masterpiece and done a ton of work and I'm in a beautiful place in my life, you know, I, I'm constantly going, okay, where else is there for me to go in my opening of my heart and my growth and recognizing patterns. And somewhere in that journey, your book um, came up and I recognized myself right away when things like, you know, normal, um, what people would call normal, uh, uh, opportunities where someone needs to leave or I like let's give it my early 20s if I got any idea that someone might be leaving me or there was a red flag I'd burn the relationship and get out of it and line up another one and I just ran 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 you know I abandoned before I got abandoned and so then it took some years to learn to stay rooted and do some things um, and so your work what I realized and love so much about your work is that you don't just say, hey, uh, you're someone who's been abandoned. It's a thing. People need to walk on eggshells around you. It's more about, I'm going to validate that your feelings are primal and they're real and they're coming from a place, but I'm also going to walk you through real um, tools so that you can create new neural pathways in your brain and you can learn uh, not to self-abandon, but to hold space. You, you helped me really learn to hold space for my big scary emotions that were easier to just at some point to avoid and not be with. And so I think your work is superbly important and um, for those of you who don't know, you've spent over 30 years as a psychotherapist with your core work around this. So I'd love to just start off with your own story of how you got into this work and then let people ask questions. And, and the, the other thing I want to say for those of you, because this is a manifesting conference, and often when we're talking manifesting our reality, it's all on the where are we going and the beautiful things but i really believe that if you have a beautiful vision that even if you manifest the most amazing things if there's a underlying subconscious kind of fear of abandonment sometimes you'll just block the beautiful manifestations that are ready for you the love that's ready to be there for you the job opportunity the whatever and so i think it's really important to know how to heal, integrate, hold all of this. So um, this is really important to me and I'm so glad that you're here. Thank you, Susan. So well, that whole thing of blocking instead of manifesting has to do with a self abandonment, which is the main issue with, with the whole issue of abandonment in adulthood. Children can be abandoned as a child. You were abandoned, I mean, by your mother and created a really intense abandonment trauma. Um, 
but in your case and many of us, uh, you developed post-traumatic strength. You know, we all know post-traumatic stress disorder and we all know what post-traumatic stress disorder of abandonment is because it's all of that, you know, that insecurity and in your case, the preemptive abandoning of your partners if you sense that you could be rejected. Um, all the, the emotional hijacking and easily being triggered and all of that stuff that we get when we have post-traumatic stress disorder of abandonment. But we also have, and you are a good example of it, post-traumatic growth. Mm -hmm. So even though we have a tendency to self-abandon and not manifest the vision, uh, we have tools that we can use to shape that and take advantage of the strengths that we are unique to each one of us, very unique. And my situation is that I had um, been a psychotherapist and working with in a psychiatric hospital and also with groups and individuals in private practice. And I saw things through the lens of separation anxiety, through the lens of abandonment. It was an issue that I was sensitive to because of my own childhood. So I would always see things in relation to that. And then 20 years into my practice, the love of my life, my marital partner, uh, left me for another woman. He and I had been, oh, we had such a, an amazing connection. But all of a sudden, boom, out the door. He just transferred all of this love and connection to someone else. And, and I was devastated. And what I discovered is that I had been very proud of all of my techniques and my tools. But when I tried to use these tools to save myself, because I was in so much pain, I discovered that the tools were too weak. It was like taking a baby aspirin for a migraine headache. Mm. So it sent me on a quest and it took many years of a lot of research and psychology and self-help did not have answers. I had to research you know, neuro, neurobiology, which was over my head, but I got a research mentor so I could understand you know, complicated studies. I, I really went on a search for three years, animal um, studies, how, how lab rats react to separation and how they get to calm down, what helps them, you know, all these different studies. And little by little, I came up with, um, tools and exercises that got into the primal wound and worked with it. it it's, for instance, a, a, a tool that was already in use and I had already been trained in it is, you know, developing an inner child dialogue with your inner child. But it needed to be repositioned and tweaked a little bit so that in doing the dialogue, you were able to reach into the primal wound because that's the part that we need to work on. Not the heartbreak or the breakup or the, the trigger that happened in adulthood. That's just a symptom. Underneath that is the primal shame, the primal fear, the primal wound of abandonment. It's universal. We all have it. But depending on what happened to us, you know, there might be a little more shame or more fear that comes out and gets triggered in spite of how strong we are and how together we are. We can look like a, a basket case when it gets triggered, when in fact we're perfectly normal people. So I worked really hard to come up with a program that would make an inroad into that, the, the actual pit of the personality, the depth, the root system, where it started, work that would get to that place. And it took a long time. <laughs> but anyway, I the with the resulting process, I call it a keru, A-K-E-R-U, a keru. It's a Japanese word. And it means to begin and to end. And there's sort of a never ending cycle. But I named my program that it's a program of physical therapy for the brain. It really works to get all the way into the center and work with it in a gradual, safe manner, the way physical therapy works. You know, you don't suddenly take a twisted wrist and go, you, yeah. you, you know, gradually you, you get it to work again. So that is the program. And that's the good news for people because 
people are have they're visionary. They have post traumatic growth. They have strengths that are unique. They know that something's holding them back. It's so frustrating. Their inner child is begging them to get them the love that they need or the career they need and all of that. But something is, as you use the word blocking, something is blocking them. Well, I think you, through the book and through your own work, and, and I have discovered kind of what that thing is, but there's good news because that thing, which is that primal wound, has the most extraordinary healing energy in it. And once we tap into that, we can really move our lives forward slowly, baby steps, but we can really move it forward. It's not a magic pill. It's not like, boom, oh, I have an insight. My whole life has changed. No, no, it's work, consistent. It's incorporating new things into a regimen, but it works. Yeah, well, I, I love this and I wanna um, maybe bring up some of the, I'm gonna share a little story and then bring up what are some of the signs and and in your book, you talk about why we all have this at some level, but what are some of the signs that this may be running things? And I'll tell you one of the signs for me one day is that in one single day, um, you know, I was in a relationship where I was seeing some red flags that the guy might not be faithful, that there may be some cheating going on. And it was something simple, like a comment on someone else's post. And these intuitions ended up being right, by the way. But, um, but when I saw that, my internal body started shaking, like trembling, like this. It felt disproportionate to what was happening because the reality is, I know I'm a beautiful woman in my own way. That I'm that the brand of me that I am, there are many men out there who love and adore and appreciate. So I wasn't gonna die. But in that moment, the feeling in my body was so primally afraid, like it, it just felt disproportionate to what was actually happening. Well, in the same day, I was sleeping and at one in the morning, my dog just started barking like this terror, like a very unique bark. And what, what happened is the front door was open and the kind of fear that was going was like, my life might be in danger fear. And that felt proportionate to waking up in the middle of the night and this, and I went, oh my gosh, these two feel so similar. Like there is something deeper going on that is not about this relationship that I'm in. This feels like a primal, deep, crazy fear. And I loved reading your book because it made me go, it's not that crazy, <laughs> you know? It felt crazy. And that's what makes it feel worse is when you're going, oh, something's wrong with me. Why am I being this way? What is happening? So, um, so I'd love, and I wanna say to everybody here, if you know me, I'm not about just hanging out in the shit or staying in the in the lowest places. I'm really about how do we progress, grow, heal. So I wouldn't bring someone to this table of topics or you know to this event if I didn't believe that in her work, in your work, there is what you said. There's not just a why are we feeling this way and more reasons to validate it. There is validation but there is actual therapy. And in your work, I found the ability to make space for my very big emotions and to feel safe with them, which is huge for confronting things that feel really overwhelming when the bells and whistles are going off, right? And, and I am about everyone getting additional support, therapists, counselors, but, um, but yeah, so I wanted to bring that to you to say, yeah, what are the signs that we might be dealing with fear of abandonment and why does everybody have it at some level? Well, let's just look at your situation with having that, that um, trigger that caused you to feel, you know, tremorous and, and shaky and, and as if your life was in danger that match the one where your front door is open and there could be life and death threat. When you're a child and you, there isn't, you have birth trauma, you know, 
you're born, you were in a womb, it's so wonderful. Now all of a sudden you're in this cold place on a bassinet. And then, so you feel disconnection from that soft thing. Then someone picks you up and you feel connection. You feel their heartbeat and the milk goes in. And, oh, and then you're put down again, disconnection. And when we're infants, we learn the connection, disconnection, good feeling, bad feeling, good feeling, bad feeling. And this goes through our childhood. We also soon discover that we can't meet our own needs, that somehow those figures who come to the bedside to pick us up, to create connection, we need them for survival because we feel helpless and like starving to death and things like that. So when a child is abandoned, let's say put in the woods or on a rock in the brook, as children have been abandoned throughout history, they're left to die because the an infant can't take care of itself. An adult can, but an infant can't. So there is, with abandonment in, in, a, in infancy, there is the likelihood, the fear of death. It's life and death. We need a caretaker. It is essential to our survival. So the trust that builds is shaky because sometimes they're there and sometimes they're not there. We scream and that brings them to the side of the crib. And sometimes we scream and they don't come. So it's, it's a shaky process and we have lots of fears built in. But then in your case, your mother left in a very, in a very traumatic, that's very traumatic. Then she came back. So in coming back now, you have to try, now it raises the stakes because now you know what she could potentially do or what it could potentially feel like. So now you're in an anticipatory trying to calm yourself and be okay, but in an anticipatory trying to trust, trying to, you know, whatever you needed to do to cope. But you, so you have the trauma of the abandonment and then the trauma of the anticipatory, do I trust? So here you are in a relationship with someone who might be a cheater and it triggers the whole thing and you get a, a your nervous system, the fight, flight or flee response, this survival instinct, those life and death, you know, the, the ner central nervous system that is absolutely involuntarily evoked, you felt it come on. And then as a gift, fate had your front door open so that you could realize that you had had a primal fear and that you could know that within you, even though you can't remember the time that you, this fear was developed or the experiences, perhaps many of them that fed that doesn't matter. You never need to remember the actual events, but the emotions are still part of you and it doesn't make you crazy. And it does, I'm speaking to you as a general, it doesn't make anyone out there or me crazy. It doesn't mean we're damaged. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with us. It means something happened beyond our control and our nervous systems did what they're supposed to do. It learned a very intense response. And those responses, they make us feel crazy a little bit but they're only temporary, they're involuntary, they're in no way a reflection on who we are, but they're also a gift because that's a primal feeling. And now that we know that feeling is there, we know what our inner child has as part of its emotional repertoire. It has mortal fear, you know, it isn't just a little afraid of maybe being alone or lonely, no. It, has a life and death fear of betrayal or of abandonment. So that helps us gain a knowledge of ourselves and helps us to love ourselves and care for ourselves and be more careful with you know, who we trust and how we evaluate people and how we value people who are trustworthy. So it is, it's a gift to make that discovery. Yeah, that is so, so powerful. Um, and thank you for breaking down the, you know, out of the womb and the, cause even though I read it in the book, I think it makes a lot of things make sense. Um, so if someone right now 
because many people will go get your book. I believe that. And you, you've got a whole website full of resources and groups when COVID's not happening and <laughs> like yeah. lots of um, free resources for free and paid resources for really, you know, working through this. But for people who are here now, um, is there like a little mini workshop we can do? Like, is there something, yeah, right here, um, looking at our... Well, let me just tell you that the best workshops are the stay ones that there aren't right now at, at Esalen or Kripalu, which, you know, they're six hours a day, two workshops a day for six days. That's a fabulous, life-changing experience. What I have now is an online five-day workshop, each workshop being two and a half hours, which is better than nothing and actually turns out to be quite valuable. What we have now is a few minutes together. Yep, yep. But in that time, so I so bearing in mind that this is a layered process, it is not, you know, it's not like five easy steps to overcoming, it's not a pill, it's really a layered process that is work intensive. But having said that, I think I could let your let your following know that getting over this is not the way to look at it. It is using this as a way of making a deeper connection with yourself. And once you create a good relationship with yourself that's based on self-love and self-acceptance, radical self-acceptance, and once you get to know yourself and know how human you are and where the things are, the things, the scars that you've acquired through no fault of your own. Once you get that sense and you have a loving self relationship, that relationship, it makes you extremely constructive in terms of how you live your life and form relationships with other people. And that there, I mean, there are five or six basic uh, exercises, but the two that I could sort of divide them up into two parts. One involves getting into the moment. It's kind of the Buddhist moment coupled with the imagination. It probably strengthens the same part of the brain that loving kindness meditation and mindfulness meditation work with. Um, that part involves being able to use your sense of future and your imagination to create a positive image to implant in your mind different from laws of attraction and the secret in the sense that you don't have to believe it. You can just pretend it and imagine it. Trying to believe it when you're dealing with abandonment is asking too much because there's all this um, hopelessness that's normal. So rather than try to believe something, it's not necessary to believe it. It in fact, it isn't true. It is just the imagination. You imagine positive images, which you know are exercises that I, I direct very carefully. Um, but they in, they're all written about in the books and videos, and I have so much on them. But they but the idea is that your imagination is your is the higher power in abandonment recovery. The other piece of it is the doing. Um, you don't think your way out of abandonment. You do your way out. So. So far, we've talked about, oh, the realization and how wonderful that is. But if you leave it at insight, and you, you hinted at this when you said the validation is there, but we need to talk about what to do. The doing part means that you're taking the healing and you're putting it in the body because the cerebral cortex tricks us into thinking that healing is somehow something we could do cerebrally. We can't. We waste all this time. It creates obsession, trying to think our way out of these crazy, you know, patterns that we get into, like where we're attracted only to the unavailable and we're hooked on someone who's no good for, you know, all these things. We try to think our way out of it. We're pining for someone. We all the stuff that we're into. We never think our way out of it. What we do is we do our way out. And the minute we do, we put it in the body. Doing meditation is a doing. You know, the mind, mindfulness is doing. Using your imagination is a doing. And so is creating a dialogue with your inner child, a written dialogue. 
writing combines so many parts of the brain, writing a dialogue about an inner child who's been repositioned to represent your primal emotions and having those emotions evoked while your cerebral cortex is trying to create words to create the dialogue and your psychomotor you know, regions are helping you with your graphomotor coordination to use your imagination, all the different parts of your mind to create a dialogue. It is strenuous physical therapy for the brain, but the doing is very important. And then the way we give, and the result of all of this is self-love, which is a profound self-love, not the usual, oh, love yourself first before you can be in a relation. This is real profound self-love. And the way we give ourselves love is not an emotion, it's doing. We give ourselves love through acts of doing, doing constructive things that will benefit our deepest goals and dreams. Little baby steps of doing. So let's say little me says, I don't feel special. I don't feel important. I, my career is not good. I don't feel good enough about myself. I'm too shy. I don't like my... And big you might say, oh, little you, thank you so much for opening up and telling me all this. I'm going to make a baby step just to show you that I really care, but I, I don't have all the answers yet, but I'm going to find out if they have an online Toastmasters group because Toastmasters lets you practice getting feedback in groups of people. I'm just gonna check it out. That'll be my baby step. So it's a baby step. You're not necessarily going to join it. You're just, you're just getting the number or the, you're looking up the link online. So it takes the love that's, I love you, little you, no matter what you tell me, I love you. Mm -hmm. Takes that words are cheap and puts it into an action, which is looking for a link to a, a program. That is self-love. And if you did one or two of those every day for 365 days, give it three years, imagine your goals and your dreams. Where would you be if you just did one baby step a day, a little teeny weeny little baby step? So the healing isn't in the emotions. It isn't in the mind just thinking it its way through. It's in a program that gets you to actually take actions through mindfulness, through visualization, through writing dialogues and many others. I'm, I'm oversimplifying. And then through tiny little baby steps, which of course gain momentum and create forward motion. And yeah. so that's kind of the short, the short of um, the program, leaving a lot of essential pieces out. There's a whole outer child piece that has to do with the self-sabotage. I'm listening to that audio, and then I've I've been uh, I've been trying to catch up on everyone's books. But before I started this virtual conference, I began reading your Outer Child, which oh. I loved so much because I personally have done a lot of inner child work, and I include some of the most profound pieces in my own book for helping people clear their blocks of worthiness and receiving. But I loved. Um, I love that outer child versus inner child. I also have done visualizing for many years. It's a core part of the way I work with myself. But now in my work because of you, being able to go into the imagination, and I'd already prayed before. I'm more woo-woo possibly than you are. Pretty sure I am, but I, <laughs> I would... um you know, go into my future self that's already doing all these things and hanging out and ask that that wisdom come and give me what I need right here. But your book was the first one where I saw and had it explained even from a neurological standpoint, taking that imagined self and having that person and you as the observer stepping away and mediating the dialogue between the successful, already healed, happy, person holding space for the inner child so if i'm talking in loops uh to people who are just coming on because you don't know what we're talking about um 
Susan, I'll let you take it further, but you really do need to get the book or the audio book to understand. And I, I'm going to look into going through one of your workshops because it sounds profound. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, the outer child is is very important component because the way we self abandon is through is through, you know, self sabotage. So let's say this is such a superficial example, but let's say I I'm on a diet and I want to lose X number of pounds. I know that's typical, isn't it? So stereotypic. Oh, sorry, but anyway, well, it's always such a good example. But but my out but the self sabotage sets in and at night I get hungry or you know something like that and so the outer child is the part that is constantly sabotaging our goals but my inner child is saying I wanted I was so I wanted you to really stick to the diet I was so feeling so hopeful and you promised and you're you're letting outer child interfere with everything because the abandonment of that child is that child wanted something from you and you're letting outer child interfere with with self indulgence with you know immediate gratification and you know you're letting outer child swoop in and take over so what it, what this is all about is that when you have unresolved abandonment trauma and it unresolved doesn't mean you've gotten rid of it unresolved means you haven't owned it back you haven't incorporated it into your relationship with yourself when you have unresolved abandonment trauma, it gives all this leeway to your outer child to say, oh, I'll fix that. You want pleasure, I'll get your pleasure. I'll get you a piece of chocolate cake. Oh, you wanna relax, I'll get you relaxation. Here, have a second glass of wine. Oh, you wanna, you, you don't want the stress of, of all the, the pressure that you're under work, I'll get yours. Uh, I'll take the stress away. We just won't do it. We'll, we'll spend the weekend watching television and avoiding all the, all the work tasks. Outer child always finds the, the quick fix, the, the sabotaging way of giving immediate gratification. So it's a very, very important and prevalent part of you know abandonment recovery because the abandonment wound gives rise to all of these stresses and the outer child jumps in to try to do all these self-sabotaging things. And then the abandonment survivor winds up not reaching their potential and that affects self-esteem so the whole outer child self-sabotaging part becomes extremely important in the whole recovery process it's part of the doing you know it's part of the doing um you know in the field of trauma to use i don't like using jargon because why bother we have such regular ways of talking about things but many people uh, uh, in your audience may be familiar with the term repetition compulsion mm -hmm. and that it's a post-traumatic part of trauma. So this, another way of saying it is when you go through any kind of an abandonment scenario going through life, it could be in, in adulthood. Afterward, it has an impact on, you might develop patterns and those patterns, we're calling them outer child patterns, but that's post-traumatic stress disorder, repetition compulsions, you know, so that's what they are. And that's a very important piece to be able to overcome because once we can get in control of, of the, or tame the outer child, then we can start to really move forward all those self-loving actions. Yeah, and I wanna say something else about this and maybe no one else needs this, but as, as someone who spent and still does spend a lot of my time, I really, I love lifting the atmosphere. I love walking. When I walk in a grocery store, I'm chatting up the person. I'm complimenting her eyes. I'm finding sincere. Like I love lightening the energy, right? And so many of the years of my life going into the darker stuff, I did it again and again because I was committed to my growth and vision. Um, you know, all the things, Landmark Forum, Millennium, like all the things, oh. you know, yeah, I, um, lots of therapy and lots of books. And I love it. I love our ability to transform that one idea or one thing can really like my life again and again, I've transformed in my life and it, it's a gift. It really is a gift that we have access to you right now, that we have access to this knowledge. But um, 
especially with a conference called manifesting a lot of times it's all about just feel good just think of the high stuff just put your vision which is great like we just had becca lewis with shifting our perspective and little switch words and things like that to help us have a that high visualization but there were years where i wasn't comfortable and certain times in my life talking about heavier topics that like this you know probably because whatever it doesn't matter why um but i, I want to give an example so a dear friend of mine uh the other day had another friend of his a multi 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 uh, millionaire so almost billionaire handsome man and he was coming on to give his business tips but what he shared is he said look this past couple years i've done a lot of work on my own fear of abandonment. He said, I didn't even realize that I had it. He said, but I would get up on stage, do my thing, I'm fine, but I didn't wanna be close to anyone off stage. And most people thought it was I was snooty or I just didn't, but he said, I was too afraid of getting close and then people leaving me or if they really know me or they must want something from me and, and then when I don't have it, they're going to abandon me, you know? Um, so I just, I'm bringing that into the space and we could bring successful person after successful, whatever that is to you, whether it's, you know, Marilyn Monroe, Robin Williams, or, you know, anybody that seems to have their life together and they've manifested the money, the love, the looks, the everything. But when you get to whatever place it is that you think you want to get to, the same internal space is running everything. And in fact, I find it's magnified. You know, with more money, you have more opportunity to feel what is already there. And you feel it even more because there's nothing dependent on. You can't go, well, when I have enough money, I'll relax. You know, whenever I have time. Um, so this is an important uh, topic. No matter where you are, um, if you're dealing with this, right? It doesn't matter what level of success because you can only receive it in if you can actually receive it in. Well, the it's an interesting dilemma um, because what happens is that the shame, abandonment shame, which we all have. So it, 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 we're ashamed of having so much shame, but we have it, so it's universal. But some of us have a little more than others. But when we get really successful. I have to watch this even in my case, because some of the goals that I've had, I, I've achieved them. And But that does not in any way mean that my shame is any less, because it just means that parts of me are able to perform. So unfortunately, we're, since we want to hide shame, shame is hidden. We just, it, it just goes deeper into the basement and hides better behind or it digs a hole and goes under the cement and goes into some part of the yard that we didn't even know existed. It just hides more. So the shame doesn't dis dissipate just because we perform at a better level and have a lot of success. The shame, the abandonment shame, which is part of the primal wound, very important part, and the fear, the shame, the, they're, the, you know, they're, they're, they're interchangeable because the fear is the fear of not being kept, not being worthy. And the shame is the shame of not being, the sh fear is the fear of being thrown away. And the shame is the fear of not being worthy of being kept, you know, they, they're hand in hand. But the shame part is so hidden, it is so buried. And it even hides out more because now we're on a stage, now we're visible, people can see us, we can be judged. The discrepancy between how we feel inside in that primal place and what the world sees is wider, the more celebrity we have, the more there's a discrepancy. So for people in a high level of success, the work of abandonment recovery, shame reduction, and all of that is even more important to, for, in many ways. I think so too. And, um, you know, I've spent the past three years being online with people and it was a big deal to, as a former people pleaser, to allow myself to be seen by, you know, saying cuss words in the middle of the prayer, being in the South and admitting that I worship the divine feminine and the divine masculine and, you know, lead a striptease class every now and then, you know, putting all that out there um, 
when you're meeting someone one-on-one, -on -one, you control what you show them. And I could just connect from my heart and it's all beautiful and feels fuzzy, right? But really when you're owning your voice and choosing to step out there and be seen, it takes something, it really does. And, um, and it's a beautiful, for me, it's been a beautiful thing growing to love and, and accept. I'm, I'm gonna read this, Zaina, and we're gonna open for questions in a minute as well. But, you know, I will say, it's not 100% comfortable for me to come on here and say, hey, this has been a big deal for me. Um, and I still, you know, have layers of work with it at different times. It's very vulnerable to share that. But here's what I know. I know that when two things, when I saw Louise Hay at 83 years old, after all of her profound success working on attention headache and EFT tapping that she said came from where her father used to shove her head under water. And she said, yeah, you know, I'm still working on it and it's still here, so I'm gonna give it another go. And that was after she had already helped millions of people with her book. She'd already published so many other authors. For one, I saw her and went, here's my hero. She's a masterpiece and she's a work in progress. All right, Adora, permission granted for you. So that's one thing. The other thing is that I know that when I open my heart and share, like this is, I mean, my hands are sweating right now, you guys. This is a vulnerable one for me because I've written about how to, I have a book where I say, do you hear me shaming shame? You know, um, but, but I know that when I open my heart and share that anyone else who's dealing with any part of this gets the opportunity to go, okay, I'm not alone. <laughs> you know, all right, maybe it's all right for me to to bring this to the table and to not, you know, try to highball it. Like, oh, you're so spiritual, you should feel better about yourself. You positive think yourself. Go say, you're, yeah, I have all the tools and I still need some more. <laughs> and and you've spent 30 years, well, you know. What's hilarious is that when I, let's say I'm running a, a pretty big abandonment workshop or something, 50 or 60 people, and they've come because they feel insecure and they sabotage their relationships by being too insecure and so forth. And I get up in front of all these people and I say, well, I have insecurity. And they all go, oh, no, even the leader <laughs> has insecurity. But of course, I get so tickled by that because I feel good about the emotions that I'm able to touch base with because they don't, these are things, these are part of me. They're, they're vulnerable parts of me. I am still essentially me. It's just that I, ha I use what I have and I share it. And it can be a little, um, jarring for people when they first see that I'm right there along with everyone else, but that I do have tools that turn this stuff into, into a lot of power and can really push your life forward. But admitting to all of the rest of it is very important to my healing because I am always de-shaming, reducing the shame the more I can bring it out of the basement, move the furniture it's hitting, hiding behind, bring it up the stairs. Oh, I mean, it's wonderful for me. So I continue to do it. And of course, I encourage other people to do it. It involves sharing, a lot of sharing. And yeah. you do that. I You've done that. that today. Yes. Well, I love that. And we've got some great, and thank you for sharing that. I, the same exhale, I hope to give other people, <laughs> you just gave to me. So <laughs> thank you yes. so much. And then I see, I, I've also heard it before. Our misery is our ministry. Our mess is our message, right? It's beautiful. We did, That's why we dedicate. Dennis Waitley, a dear friend and mentor, wrote the psychology of winning when he felt like a loser. And he still uses his own tools today, right? So they're not oh, these yes. off kind of things. That's the point. We continue to use them. Okay. Oh, yes. So Zaina says, this discussion is really piercing me to the core. Thanks for the conversation. I'm definitely going to get the book. Fawn says, I feel the same. Zaina says, does conditional love by a parent create abandonment issues? Um, well, it's, it's a complicated question. The answer is that we 
we grow dependent on our parents and any personal lacking on their part, they could be narcissistic, they could be borderline, they could be going through a depression. Um, you mentioned your father kind of leaving you emotionally. Was he going through abandonment because your mother left? I mean, we go through our parents' grief, our parents' abandonment, sec it's secondary abandonment. We, we have parents who give us what they can, but if they want us to succeed, they, they prefer another sibling because they make them prouder. Parents have shame that is assuaged by the, by the conditional, you know, success of their children. Oh, it's so complicated. So yes, there are all these layers of abandonment as you feel the connection, remember, connection, disconnection, connection, dis you know, you're programmed to love the feeling of connection and not like it when there's a disconnect. So when the love is only conditional, that disconnection feeling will be will be evoked. So that becomes kind of a chronic, episodic, you know, kind of, you know, repetitive kind of abandonment, maybe a mild one at times, but it's there. Yeah, Zaina, great, great, great question. And um, I think we had another one, we had another comment and it was, um, yeah, working on ourselves never stops because of the many layers we have, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, um, you had mentioned in your book too, and Veronica, I see you're here. We're gonna be passing or coming to you, our next speaker soon. Um, but I think another really important thing, two core things that I want to um, point to. One, in your book, you talk about that sometimes, you know, you have these big stories. Like I, I definitely have a big dramatic story that matches my personality, right? Um, and was what my soul came to to experience but then you have people who go well i i shouldn't feel this way i have no reason to feel it and i think it's so great that you say um you know we all have it at some level and it's a survival thing in infancy and you don't have to remember why or how and you don't need to feel ashamed for that so those of you who might be on the line and going but they had this story or that story like welcome to the club and the other thing is um I've, I've spent over 20 years reading books because they've changed my life. Like the authors have raised me, which is why I'm so happy to be part of the industry that impacted me so much. Um, your book, in a way that I have not ever experienced, really allowed me to find ways to feel very safe with my super biggest emotions with my super biggest, darkest, like I don't even wanna go there kind of emotions. And part of that may be the foundation that was laid, but a major part of it is the dedication and time that you took studying, researching, becoming intimately acquainted with, but not just hanging out there, right? Because when someone's just telling you what's wrong, it, it's like, it doesn't feel good to just stay there you really took the time to figure out what it takes to do the physical therapy for the brain to really heal and to really be able to and you know god makes me feel there there are certain spaces that i hit in prayer and in spiritual places that that seem to just really hold my emotions but i'm talking about me with me when I'm I'm not looking to my higher, higher, and even in my higher, higher, in a primal freak out, I'm like, God, please help me, oh my God, right? And so you, you really have done some beautiful practical things for spirits in a physical form to know how to work with the machine of our brain, our nervous system, and, and to feel safe inside which is number one this is the core universe that everything comes from and today we've over the past few days starting with rami shapiro we talked about it's not just about the light it's about embracing the dark and divine mother isn't just about the nurturing healing loving she's the 
also the one that tears down what's no longer working just like you know our menstrual cycle removes what no longer is serving and so um you're a person that really is a stand for being able to be with that with ourselves which i think is so phenomenal and i appreciate you thank you thank you for the interview it's it's been just a wonderful experience for me too to share with you. You've been very real and open and I really appreciate that. It allows me to feel that I can, you know, really reciprocate and, and be as open. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. So we still have about eight uh, minutes before we officially need to be bring on Veronica. So Fawn and Zaina, some of you felt really, you know, touched by this. Do you want to say anything? Ask any questions? I think Fawn's unmuting. Are you, Fawn? No? Okay. And Do Zaina, you did you take a break? Yes, I'm going to take a quick ladies room between. Um, where are you, Marianne? There you are. Okay, so I'll let you continue this part. And uh, Susan, I'll be back in touch. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. Go ahead and turn off the um, recording. <laughs>